I'm Mary Chapman, Academic Director of UBC Vancouver's Public Humanities Hub. I'm just going to give people a few minutes to get settled and we'll, then we'll get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to this presentation about infographics as public scholarship, a session co-sponsored by the UBC Learning Exchange and the Public Humanities Hub. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the hub is located on the unsurrendered traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam people. These lands were sites of learning for many generations before UBC stood here, and we recognize our obligations as scholars and learners to ensure that the work we do upholds the best of that longstanding learning context. Since this is an online event, I invite you to provide a land acknowledgement um, for where you're standing today in the chat, if you wish. Now, our session today about infographics as public scholarship is part of a series of events about public scholarship that the Hub programs each year. If you look at our website, you'll see that over the past three years, we've sponsored 15 sessions about writing op-eds, commentary, biography, creative works, on curating exhibits, producing podcasts, marketing monographs, and many more topics. To complement these sessions and to guide UBC researchers to local resources that can help them work in these public-facing genres, we've also produced toolkits so far on curating exhibitions, producing podcasts, using Wikipedia, writing op-eds, and creating accessible events at UBC. Have a look. The next one about info. Hi folks. Uh, it seems like we've had some kind of disruption to the Zoom call here. Uh, I'm just messaging some of the other folks who are involved in this. Um, we're just getting things back up online here, so hopefully we won't be delayed for too long. Sorry about this. So I believe uh, many of us are back in. Uh, my name is Nick Eubles. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Community Engagement Librarian uh, at the UBC Learning Exchange. Uh, and I will be co-moderating today's panel with Shannon Murray, uh, who will have a chance to introduce herself in a little bit. Um, so as Mary was saying uh, before she was unfortunately cut off, um, today's panel is about infographics as a form of public scholarship. So our four panelists today will reflect on uh, and consider a range of topics related to that theme. So data storytelling through infographics, uh, using infographics as a teaching tool, infographics as a genre of scholarly communication, uh, as well as knowledge mobilization through infographics. Uh, the format will be each of our four panelists will have uh, about 15 minutes to talk. And our first two panelists will Okay, sorry about that. So I think Nick is frozen for us all. Um, but what he was saying is each panelist will have about 15 minutes to speak. Uh, our first two speakers, uh, Kirby Munya and Evan Morrow will speak jointly. Um, and then we will lead into our Q&A portion of the panel. Feel free to uh, add questions into to the chat as we go, or at the end of the session, you can add your questions to the chat. Um, I will briefly introduce myself now and maybe just provide a little bit of context for why Nick and I are the moderators today as we get into Kirby and Evan's portion of the presentation. So I am a student librarian uh, for the Making Research Accessible Initiative, and I currently am a graduate academic assistant for supporting transparent um, and open engagement and exchange. So my own interest and work with infographics started through a professional experience project that I did through the School of Information here at UBC, in which I am currently a student. I worked with Nick at the Learning Exchange to evaluate some uh, student-made infographics through the ASTU 100 course that are currently on the Research Access Portal. I created some tools for students to use, so this included a guide, a checklist, a video, and a workshop. These tools were developed through research, uh, as well as community engagement with downtown Eastside community members uh, through the form of focus groups. This has extended into my current work term, and in this role as a student librarian, I've been able to continue working with our first two speakers, Kirby Munya and Evan Morrow, who have put together this joint talk uh, that they'll be sharing this afternoon. And you're going to learn some more about the AST 100 project, as well as infographics in the classroom. 
So Kirby Manya earned a PhD in English from the University of the Witwatersrand Fund and holds a Master of Arts in Modern Literature and Culture from the University of York. She has taught courses in the environment, literary studies, and academic writing at universities in South Africa and Canada. Her research focuses on the crossover between urban spaces, literature, and the environment. She's particularly interested in post-apartheid South African literature, urban ecologies, environmental justice, post-colonial eco-criticism, and writing pedagogy. Recent examples of her scholarly work can be found in English Studies in Africa and the Journal of Commonwealth Literature. She also writes poetry and co-edits an eco-urban poetry journal called Sprout. Evan Morrow uh, is a lecturer of the Coordinated Arts Program and Department of English at UBC. His research is in global, or sorry, cultural studies and critical theory, American literature after 1865, global moder modernisms and critical university studies. His work can be found in Fast Capitalism, Topia and Mediations. So now I will finally pass it over to Kirby and Evan to get us started and they'll share uh, their presentation with us now. Uh, thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Nick, wherever you are. Uh, can I get anybody to hit a reaction button and give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Sweet, okay. Uh, and thanks uh, also to uh, Professor Chapman and the Public Humanities Hub for hosting us. Uh, I guess the benefit of doing a co-presentation with Kirby is that if I freeze up, uh, Kirby can just take over. Uh, so hopefully that works. Um, thanks to, to uh, uh, everybody for logging in and for logging back in. Um, I'm gonna sort of outline a project here today uh, that we've been doing in the coordinated arts program uh, in which first year art students We're losing are you, Evan. making uh, i'm getting in the chat that i can be i can be heard from some folks so uh, i'm going to keep going but kirby please feel free to just uh to do that again if i if i uh break up uh so yeah i we're here to outline a project that we've run in the project or sorry in the coordinated arts program uh, we have first year art students making infographic summaries of community engaged research. And then they're publishing these on the uh, research access portal, uh, which is housed at the UBC Learning Exchange uh, and is part of the Making Research Accessible initiative that uh, I think Nick referred to uh, earlier. Uh, it's important to note that uh, this is, we're sort of standing here and talking about this project, but it's a big project with a lot of collaborators, namely uh, our two uh, facilitators here today, Nick and Shannon, uh, but also, of course, others at the MRAI. So uh, Heather Holroyd was crucial, uh, Professor Angela Toll was instrumental in getting us rolling, uh, the whole steering committee, and particularly uh, Desiree Barron from the MRAI steering committee helped us sort of figure out how to teach infographics when we first started. So it's a big team. Uh, we're here speaking for it uh, today, but uh, and I would also probably want to acknowledge that we have a lot of uh, participating researchers um, who essentially agree to let our students have at their uh, research, <laughs> and they actually give our students feedback and uh, at key points in the process that Kirby will talk about. But I'm going to share a screen and uh, get a couple of slides up, and we'll talk our way through this project. <clears throat> Ideally, you can see this. Uh, we're going to talk about first year students as knowledge translators. Um, so in publishing these infographics, we have uh, learned a great many things about infographics. Uh, they're sort of a, a fun but complex form to teach with. Uh, and complex in ways that we maybe didn't expect. Uh, we learned things about infographics and design, about copyright and publishing, uh, and about our main focus, or at least mine, uh, I'll speak for myself only, about community-engaged and social justice-oriented research uh, that's happening locally in Vancouver. Um, the talk that we're going to give will do this. Uh, I'm gonna uh, start by outlining the project's history and its sort of overall aims. Uh, Kirby will take you through infographic making. So what we've produced, we'll look at a bunch of infographics and the process that we use, and then we'll sort of both talk about uh, the lessons that we've learned um, along the way. Uh, so just as a brief project overview, <clears throat> as mentioned, uh, first year art students are making infographics in our courses, are making infographic summaries of downtown Eastside related research articles in collaboration with those articles authors. 
uh, then those infographics that our students make are published on the research access portal, which uh, we'll show some of in a little bit. Um, and we think of these infographics as a sort of a form of knowledge translation. Uh, they're developing students' skills in research writings, uh, or sorry, in research writing, but also their understanding of research's scope and effects. Um, you know, I think that what we've found is that this project really helps meet and even exceed our course objectives, which are really to help students learn about academic research, uh, its cultures, its circulation. But uh, it does this by contributing to what we think of as a pretty exciting uh, knowledge mobilization project that's aiming to make research more accept, uh, accessible to more people. Now, this is what it looks like. And actually, um, <clears throat> Nick, if you're on the call, maybe Shannon, if you have the link, uh, I was going to drop into the chat the uh, link to the uh, infographics that we published at this point on the research access portal. But each of them basically looks something like this, right? So this would be a research access portal page for an article. Um, this one about food security uh, and the downtown east side neighborhood house. Um, the articles will either be free use or restricted use. You'll see that icon at the article. Kevin, are you back? I can hear you, Kirby. Can you hear me? Okay, now, now I can hear you, yes. Okay. Well, I'll press forward. Thank you for waiting. I'm not sure where I cut off. What was the last thing you heard? Um, you were talking about the restricted use of um, content on the wrap. Thanks. So uh, thanks for sharing the link, uh, Nick. I see it in the chat now. Um, yeah, so it's particularly useful for these restricted use articles. They're still paywalled, and you can access uh, instead this sort of author uh, approved uh, uh, research summary in infographic form that our students have prepared. Um, so that's broadly uh, <clears throat> some of the product. I'd like to just briefly, if it's okay, uh, describe. Uh, describe the partnership as it developed a little bit of the history of it. I was going to do a timeline. The thing about teaching infographics is you start to start like thinking about your PowerPoint slides in new ways and how you're going to present information visually. But I just went with a sort of a uh, uh, compare and contrast of our uh, respective uh, organizations who partnered here and what our needs and aims were. So uh, we teach in the coordinated arts program um, and you know we teach uh, 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 Art Studies 100, which is a full year course that combines the teaching of academic writing and literature. Our focus uh, in our stream is law and society. So we've been uh, over a few years um, developing some community engaged relationships, that's CEL relationships with uh, local uh, local social justice law firms and local human rights organizations. Uh, and we often bring in guest speakers to speak to their work. Uh, they speak about uh, movements for police accountability, movements for harm reduction. Um, they speak about indigenous sovereignty and sort of larger issues of structural injustice and violence. And that's uh, been in place for a number of years. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have issues or we've sort of had a long standing um, question around how to make those relationships reciprocal in the sense that we've been trying to find ways that our students could <clears throat> meaningfully engage with the communities that we learn from in a non extractive way. Um, and so this is actually sort of a long standing problem in CEL uh, and particularly. Uh, uh oh, I'm getting the in Internet connection is unstable. Um, pop up again. So if I, um, if I freeze, I'm terribly sorry. Um, but essentially, you know, we're thinking about what competencies and skills our students can offer communities that they learn with. And this is a particularly intense problem in first year, just because first year students are thought to not have the types of skills that um, organizations and communities uh, um, desire. So things like uh, database skills or um, organizing skills, event planning skills, that sort of thing. We can't, we can't say that 18-year-old students in first year know how to do that. 
Um, the MRAI, um, <clears throat> basically, uh, my understanding of it comes from a talk that Professor Angela Toll gave to a group of community-engaged scholars on campus. And uh, where I heard this talk, it was about six months before this research access portal went live. Um, and Professor Toll was talking about the ways that they were trying to um, repatriate research to the downtown east side, but a lot of this research remained paywalled. And so there was a need for plain language research summaries. Um, and so we saw that, you know, we're teaching students how to learn, cite, summarize, and respond to scholarly articles. This is the last point on the slide. Um, the MRAI needed plain language summaries. And so we thought maybe we could um, work together and see if there was room to um, make a project for our students. Um, it turned into, um, infographics, we decided to go with infographics. Um, <clears throat> just really quickly, this was Ange uh, Professor Toll's suggestion, I think partly because of her background in public health, uh, where infographic knowledge uh, mobilization projects are a little bit more common than in the humanities, but uh, we decided that it sounded great, we could probably work with that. Um, we, uh, since the project has grown a little bit and a definition of infographics that we're using uh, in the project comes from, Shannon uh, actually found this, but it's uh, a larger graphic design that combines data visualizations, illustrations, text, and images together into a format that tells a complete story. Um, the reason that I like this definition is um, specifically around the question of it tells a complete story. Um, the story part is important for us because we, I think, are um, focusing more on qualitative and humanities-based research that isn't sort of given to data visualization, for example, and narrative becomes really important for our approach. Kirby's going to say a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, uh, infographics appeal to us as sort of a visually attractive way to um, to render information and complex research findings uh, more accessible to more people. And that's why we've decided to, to go with them. Uh, particularly, I th we thought it was promising for our application where we're trying to communicate research findings to a range of publics within the downtown east side to whom research is usually inaccessible for a number of reasons, whether it's paywalls or the fact of specialist language, uh, the length of articles, um, style, all of these. One of the things that we hypothesized early on in the project sort of our, our running uh, hypothesis going into it is that first year students might actually be perfect for this role uh, to translate articles into infographics. Um, they're sort of uh, at the point at which uh, we uh, give them this project, they're exactly skilled enough to do credible research summaries, but <clears throat> excuse me, not so specialized yet that their work would be super jargon filled uh, and too academic for broader audiences. So we had a kind of a theory of the different sorts of literacies required to do knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization work. And so far, you know, we're three years into this project and we think that our theory has borne out um, relatively well. So that's where we're at. Now I'm gonna pass the mic to Kirby, who's gonna show you some infographics and talk through them. All right, if I do freeze, Evan, please uh, take over the reins. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what you'll see very shortly uh, are a few examples produced by our students in the course. Um, so a mixture of past students and current students and the infographics that they have um, uh, created as a result of their ASTU 100 course. So within the course itself, we have a course assignment where students produce infographic summaries of research um, on the research access portal, the RAP. And the RAP consists of research done in and about the downtown Eastside community. And it functions as a knowledge exchange hub between university and community. And it meets a number of other needs too. So community needs, uh, agency and advocacy groups needs. And it meets one very key demand from the Research 101 Manifesto for Ethical Research in the Downtown East Side, which uh, Evan will talk about in a moment. Um, and that's what uh, Evan's already mentioned, this important need to have research that's performed on the downtown east side and with community members to have it repatriated to the community itself in an accessible form. 
And actually one of the explicit recommendations in the manifesto is that plain language summaries are produced and made available to community members. So we're aligning our assignment with these community-based research protocols and informing it um, on principles of reciprocity. So we partner with researchers who have strong ties to the communities in which they research and work. And we offer to do a knowledge translation project for them and ask for their participation in it to give feedback to the students on their work, which I'll describe a little bit more shortly. So the project helps our students in their learning about community engaged um, work. It helps the RAPS mandate to make research more accessible to the community. And it helps participating researchers in meeting their own knowledge translation goals. So we feel that this is a reciprocal model and is very, a, a very well suited to our approach to incorporating community engaged learning into our first year curriculum. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Evan. All right, so it's the next, yeah, that one, perfect. So what you can see there is um, students engaging in the workshop um, that Shannon and Nick, um, Evan and I ran for them um, on uh, workshop uh, infographic production. So our process in this assignment involves several steps and it's quite iterative. And we have developed and revised this assignment uh, with our MRAI collaborators on an annual basis. So I'm going to break it down into steps and they relate to, different, to four parts of um, their assignment of which I'll only discuss the first three parts, which you can see um, represented on the left hand side, uh, left hand side of the slide. So in step one, we ask students to read the assigned scholarly source that's hosted by the RAP. And then individually students write a one page plain language point form summary. As we teach summaries earlier on in the course, students have experience um, with, uh, with engaging with citation, uh, citing uh, and attributing responsibly, conveying just accurately, learning how to adequately paraphrase, identifying levels of generality. This all forms, uh, all forms part of the bro broader context of a genre-based writing curriculum. Then in step two, the students uh, bring together all their individual summaries in the form of discussion groups, and they work on the strengths and cogencies of their individual uh, summaries to produce a single group summary. Uh, and so a consolidated single summary as a group. So it's a collaborative effort. Then the excellent uh, plain language point form summaries are sent to the lead, authors, uh, lead author of the article. And they offer feedback and suggest revisions. And then the students make changes accordingly. And we feel it's very important uh, to collaborate with the lead author and to check in at this particular stage of the project. Then once we have received the, um, the, ch the revised summary from the students, we then proceed to the infographic stage of the assignment. So all student groups then consult the author approved uh, plain language point form summary as the foundation on which to build their infographic. And then once they've produced their infographic, the best infographics again are sent back to the lead author who gives feedback and approves, um, approves the product. So we feel like this, the, the importance of author feedback is um, it, it meets a number of different goals. It's really rare for a first year student um, to have an external set of eyes evaluating their work, let alone a field specialist, let alone the actual author themselves of the secondary source they're engaging with. And they can detect minor points of inflection or uh, misconveyance of gist and rectify that. Um, and this process was part of um, MRAI's suggestion as it aims to make RAP participation reciprocal and based on ongoing consent of participating researchers at every step. And the researcher feels that the final product that gets um, published is a good representation of their article or their study. So um, something that uh, we have encountered as a bit of a challenge is that a lot of infographic visuals are built around particular data visualization strategies with a bias towards quantitative research. So we often in infographics see pie charts, bar graphs and other visualization strategies that work quite well with quantitative data. 
And so most of the sources that we work with are qualitative methodologies, qualitative um, data. So there are humanities and social science articles. Um, and so to move away from those uh, patterns or um, strategies around quantitative methodologies, we have emphasized visual storytelling. So if we have a text heavy source, we try and emphasize that the infographic should unfold like a story. So a kind of research narrative as a way in which to bridge the divide between the point form plain language summary and the infographic, which ideally designs and, and visualizes that research. So we encourage linear uh, modes, left to right, bottom, top to bottom, and thinking of each section as a chapter or subsection of the article. All right, uh, Evan, if you could uh, change slides, please. So what have we learned from this process of uh, working with students and creating infographics um, from the past three years? So researcher participation can sometimes result in uh, a few complications and negotiations around the summary. And this is to be expected in any editorial process. But sometimes the author wants specific wording maintained. So we've had experience with particularly um, uh, uh, challenging abstractions that are key to the research claim that the author is wanting to get across, but made the students feel wouldn't be accessible to a general reader. And so thinking about how we negotiate that, do we put in a synonym? Do we use a, an unobtrusive apposition to define that uh, so we can make uh, and meet both, both, both demands? Uh, something else that's incredibly important is learning from the community what it wants, because we're uh, informed by reciprocity. We want these uh, to be authentic infographics, and we want them to be used by community members. And so what's been really, really helpful for us here is Shannon Murray's work. Um, she uh, compiled a guide and a report and also conducted focus groups, both with community members with lived experience in the downtown east side. Um, but also with members of community organizations. And they held 60 minute fo focus groups. They printed out our infographics and uh, had uh, participants look at things in terms of language and tone, visual elements, design, comprehension and utility. So very important things have come through in those focus groups, which we have now taken into our teaching of our infographics this year and have guided our students using this kind of toolkit, this, this, this toolbox. So very importantly, went into our, uh, our teaching of this year to say we need to avoid extraneous images and the overuse of decorative visuals. We, students need to consider placement, appropriateness and relevance of the images that they have selected. That it is better to incorporate white space so that there's a clear white background for accessibility reasons. Uh, to choose less decorative fonts, so favoring sans serif fonts and scale them appropriately depending on whether they are headings or there are um, uh, bullet points beneath those headings. Uh, that students should adopt a simple color scheme, so have a pared down palette of only three to four colors, uh, and then choose a simple layout with very clearly defined sections. In terms of the language of the infographic and the audience, uh, we're aiming for 200 to 250 words. So in these two infographics we see on the right-hand side produced by students in a previous year, on the left-hand side, one of the concerns was that it was too text heavy um, and it was inaccessible um, and difficult to negotiate. There was a lot going on there. Whereas on the right-hand side, much easier to see bigger uh, white spaces, but perhaps wasn't enough text. And so it left the focus groups with more questions than answers. And also what was a key thing is to remember the origins of the source through selective use of quotations. So on the right-hand side with these two uh, infographics, what we did with our students is we held a, um, a Shannon recorded a lecture where she communicated best practices, gave them a foundation to think about these things critically. We had an activity that followed up where we got students to look at past students' infographics to say, what is effective? What works? Uh, what do you think that you would want to incorporate? What would you avoid? So they went into the process this year with a very um, uh, well-equipped foundation on which to build. And then we held a workshop where students got to interact with each other um, and develop and devise their uh, uh, infographics um, 
with a, a helpful rubric. Okay, um, uh, I, I'm handing over to you, Evan. Sure, thanks. I'm going to hand it right back and really quickly here because I feel like this slide, uh, I'm mindful of time, but uh, we've sort of uh, shifted a little bit of our uh, emphasis uh, over the years that we've been doing this project. Uh, basically, we try to take research ethics and that Research 101 manifesto uh, to heart uh, and think carefully about uh, the ways that we're uh, engaging with uh, a, an over-researched population, right? Um, the Research 101 Manifesto, for those of you who uh, haven't seen it, is a really important document published by Scott Newfeld and a number of community co-authors, uh, and it really emphasizes the need for research to think about uh, the ways that it's engaging with community and the ways that it's representing them in the uh, in the research that it's publishing. So initially, when we started this project, we were really emphasizing asset-based research, uh, emphasizing research that destigmatizes the downtown east side and looks at like constructive community building projects like uh, we saw a minute ago there was uh, an infographic for a link van project about digital divides and uh, and getting technology into people's hands lately uh, as Kirby just mentioned we've been tackling more complex topics uh, our sort of guide there is to partner with community engaged researchers who uh, have uh, you know uh, have relationships with community groups uh, uh, and take a sort of a community engaged, engaged approach to their research. Um, and those partnerships with communities become crucial to us. Okay, I raced through that slide. Kirby, I'm gonna pass it back to you now. Okay, thank you. So through this project, um, it has offered insight into a number of complex questions about what kinds of literacies are required to um, engage with knowledge translation effectively. And as first year students are just beginning to learn research conventions, we do think that they're very well positioned to translate knowledge, to function as these knowledge brokers and to work as discursive intermediaries. So they, we position them as apprentice scholars or apprentice researchers in our course, that they're learning the moves and practices used by writers in their writing situations. And they're understanding the key features of genre and discourse. Um, uh, relating to audience, purpose, and situation. But what is also very useful to remember is that they have a fresh memory of entering the academy and encountering the opacity of academic writing and discipline-specific jargon. So really, in this way, we're ideally positioned to work as knowledge intermediaries and interlocutors, so able to track, they're able to track scholarly argument, but also recognize how discourse used in the academy might be inaccessible to those outside of it. So writing a plain language summary and creating an infographic teaches genre-based writing concepts and students see themselves as knowledge brokers. They're negotiating the meaning of a piece in two directions and aware of two audience members, the lead author and the researchers that wrote it, as well as the community and the community's needs and understanding it. So pedagogically, this allows us as instructors to become more like informed collaborators than evaluators, and we're helping them put together a draft for multiple audiences. Uh, we do see uh, in our students that they exhibit pre-existing digital nativity and visual talent. So they really surprise us with their graphical intuition and how to use digital content. Um, and that's always a welcome, a welcome surprise. There are a number of benefits to um, student learning with this assignment and with this project is that it offers students a publication opportunity, which is uh, um, really motivating to them. Uh, and a fantastic opportunity at a first year level to have research adjacent work published on the UBC uh, library portal. It presents them with a natural and authentic critical learning environment. They're writing for a real audience, not just for their instructor. Um, they're getting real feedback from authors. Um, and this is a project based in the principles of reciprocity. They're working in research um, teams and they're involved in research advocacy. All right, so um, next slide, please, Evan. We're thinking about um, uh, what our students have learned and I'm handing it over to you. Turn your oh, mic on. Uh, <laughs> I'll make this one as quick as I can. We have been surveying and interviewing students over the three years that we've been doing this. Here are some of the 
things that they've told us. I'll get to the quote in just a second. They told us that the project looks really simple on the surface of it, but is actually very hard to do. Um, they told us that uh, doing it feels meaningful to them. They feel like they're contributing to a project of social change. They see themselves as agents of change within that process. Uh, and you know, they uh, come out of it with a politics uh, around uh, the necessity to make research findings as accessible as possible. Um, <clears throat> they tell us that they appreciate learning a practical skill, which uh, as teachers of academic writing and literature, we try not to take that personally, but that's what they tell us, there it is. <laughs> uh, and then about writing specifically, and this I think follows up on the point that Kirby just made, that students in first year have that fresh memory of the opacity of a research text, right? Just sort of getting this block of long paragraphs, long sentences, and being a bit alienated by it. This quote I think tells us just that. One student said in an interview, uh, a lot of the rest of learning to write in first year university is how do you write this write at this super high academic level that doesn't really exist previously. And so the interesting thing I found with doing the kind of community engaged learning was the opposite direction. How do you take this really complicated academic language and actually bring it down to earth and make it a little uh, sort of make it kind of a little bit more plain language and accessible for a larger audience. Um, so I would just underline here that we think that this means that first year students are pretty well positioned to do this sort of knowledge translation. Um, that experience of confusion when confronting a research article is a sort of a very fresh memory and uh, the motivation to do translation work is fairly easy for uh, our students to find. Uh, over to you, Kirby. All right, thank you, Evan. And we're just wrapping up here. So we just wanted to share some of the limitations of this project and how we are using this as a way to frame and, and inform our thinking uh, about how to do this in future years. So um, some of the uh, some of the limitations are um, technological. So we use uh, free templates uh, on Canva, PictoChart, and Visme, and these these can sometimes be limiting. Uh, it would be perhaps better to use more ground up designs with more uh, involved programming, except that we perhaps um, not necessarily have the skill base for that. So there is limitations in terms of what we can do with the templates that are available to us. That goes the same thing in terms of imagery and dealing with copyright material. Um, and so uh, we are careful about how we go about doing this. We don't use um, copywritten, copyrighted material, uh, but sometimes our students have, have made their own maps for their infographics. Uh, and another thing, I think this is a limitation largely on us, is that we have limited formal training in the principles of good visual design. And we've been very grateful and thankful to someone like Shannon, who's come in and helped us uh, so much. Uh, in terms of the function uh, limitations is that there are different genre expectations uh, when it comes to the final product and it's a, this process of ne negotiation between our collaborators, collaborators, authors, ourselves, our students and the community members. And it's about uh, trying to get that balance right, have a compelling design, have an e effective visual storytelling. It should be the, the appropriate length that it adequately represents the rigors of an article's gist, but still is accessible to a general reader. And this is a tightrope that we walk each year, uh, and it is a tricky one. Uh, and then one I mentioned earlier is that the challenges are to producing um, cogent infographics that uh, reflect qualitative research and data. Um, so I think what's important to stress is that each year we learn more and more about this project. And in synthesizing our experiences, working with students, researchers, our MRAI collaborators, and receiving feedback from the community, this project is successful as long as it is responsive to the needs of all its stakeholders and that we continuously evolve and learn from mistakes that we may, may make. Great, thank you so much, uh, Evan and Kirby, for that excellent presentation and overview of the collaboration uh, that's into its third year now. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Lupin Battersby. Uh, Dr. Battersby is Simon Fraser University's Knowledge Mobilization Officer. She is responsible for achieving the goals of the SFU KM Hub, uh, including providing training, expert consultations, and recognition of KM work. Her KM fire was sparked almost 20 years ago when holding two contracts, one as a clinical counselor, the other as a research assistant, she noticed firsthand the gap between research and practice. Since that time, she has worked in roles in and out of academia with a primary focus on the challenges and opportunities to mobilize research in various areas, including health services, mental health, housing, 
aging and patient engagements. And without further ado, I will head it off to Dr. Battersby. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second. And I have a feeling that we maybe are a little bit behind our schedule. Um, is that right, Nick? I can, uh, you know, mobilize myself to be a little faster. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me today. Um, glad to have uh, an opportunity to connect with um, with UBC and this project, uh, which um, I hadn't actually heard of until this invitation came. So now I'm feeling really excited about it. And I have loved hearing Evan and Kirby's um, presentations, giving me lots of ideas that I'm going to hopefully be able to steal um, for SFU. Uh, but until then, um, as the Knowledge Mobilization Officer, I am supporting researchers. So uh, sometimes that's students, but it's not. Um, in that uh, teaching capacity, it's more about um, helping them be strategic about knowledge mobilization. And so I need to define that term for you. Um, this is SFU's definition of knowledge mobilization. It's an intentional approach to enhance the real world impact of research through knowledge exchange between researchers and end users, uh, collaboratively building research, sharing findings, and engaging with research outputs and products. So um, I would say uh, uh, clearly it's it's a the the work of Kirby and Evan um, and the the downtown Eastside project is is in this realm. Um, and you can see uh, my emphasis here on the exchange. So it's really about um, the the two way uh, sharing um, from community and researchers or community researchers. And uh, we take this big umbrella approach to it in that um, it includes both the, the doing and the studying of knowledge mobilization, which may include any of these other terms that you might've heard of. Um, and speaking of terms that you might've heard of, there is a number of them in this knowledge mobilization space. I think today we've heard knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation. Um, this little uh, graphic that I'm showing you here is just some of the popular terms that are out there. Of course, I've put knowledge mobilization in the center because that's the term that I prefer. Um, so I'd like to make my bias really clear. And, uh, but you can see that um, <clears throat> there's differences from geography, geographical like location in the, in the US and the UK, there might be different terms that are popular. Um, and we know UBC uses knowledge exchange usually, and SFU uses knowledge mobilization, um, as does our social sciences and humanities research council. Uh, so just in case knowledge mobilization isn't your term, I'm sure you can find yourself on this, this wheel somewhere. So what I wanted to sort of talk about is like what I do when I'm working with uh, folks that are wanting to do knowledge mobilization. Um, before they uh, get started and deciding on what kind of an output that they're gonna create, I encourage folks to address these other, these first three questions on your screen. Um, so what are you sharing? And uh, the emphasis here is that it's not just about research or data, um, it could be other things that we're sharing, okay? So it's uh, kind of defining what you mean by what is knowledge um, and, and so on. Uh, and then, really important is why are you sharing it? Um, to create something really excellent is to know what the purpose or intention of the product is. Uh, and then of course, who your audience is. And with all things knowledge mobilization, that is going to um, probably require a bit of a, a loop and, and reflecting back through, through the questions. Once you've answered one, you might, who your audience is, <clears throat> you might need to change uh, your purpose statement. That after you've defined all of those, uh, then you get to get into the fun creative part of how are you gonna share your work? And um, there's obviously lots of different ways that can happen. Um, there is the sort of these overarching principles or ideas that I have on the screen of partnering, dissemination, implementation, but then there's like the nitty gritty strategies like uh, infographics. Um, and then of course, always, want folks to uh, think about how they'll know whether or not they've achieved their purpose. So that's sort of like 
the core elements of any uh, knowledge mobilization um, planning or, or um, studying of it, really. So I know we've talked already about what an info infographic is. Ellen gave us a great definition. Here is another one. Uh, here is an infographic of the definition of an infographic. Um, obviously, this one is, uh, is saying data, but I would say um, data isn't, of course, only quantitative, okay, so it's also qualitative, um, but uh, I just like the visual data sorted, arranged, and presented visually. So um, infographics can be a great knowledge mobilization tool, but um, they are to be used uh, if it makes sense for your audience with the um, uh, content that you that you need to share and um, to achieve your goals. So again, I've just sort of added this, even when once you've got your knowledge mobilization plan for your full project, then I encourage folks to then kind of use those questions um, for each product that you develop. So um, if you don't have the benefit in being in that uh, class with Evan and Kirby to help you through, this might be a place if you're a researcher to, or uh, someone working in research, um, might be a place to start. So uh, before you, you start crafting that infographic, it's identifying the key messages. And um, in this case, so sort of just to juxtapose it to the, the plain language summaries that we were talking about earlier, is that I mean, you might be working on this before you actually have written a publication, or um, you might be working on this as one part of your research, uh, not necessarily the full the full story. This might also be something that, say, you could even use as developing your conference poster or something like that. So, identifying the key messages again: what's the purpose of the infographic? Who is going to be looking at it? So, is it other folks in your field? Or um, is it going to be a public audience or um, maybe uh, practitioners of some sort or um, maybe policymakers, so on. And then there's a whole bunch of obviously design pieces that you need to think about, but also like format, style and distribution. If you have an infographic, you do need to, to share it somehow. Um, and you might not have a portal uh, already ready to go. So I'm gonna give you um, a little tour of infographics. So a classic one everybody knows is like a bus map or a metro map. This one's from Wa Washington, D.C. And just take a moment and think about why, why would you have this infographic? Who would this infographic be, be for? And um, what are they sharing? Right? So when you're trying to think about that for yourself, you can use this as a sort of example of like, okay, they're sharing this probably with uh, visitors to DC. Um, they're sharing information about the metro lines and also the transfer stations and how, and a little bit about the um, main sort of tourist attractions and how they could get there by bus. Um, and uh, how they're sharing it, which I think is important here too, is like, this is kind of hard to read, but I imagine this is probably on buses, so it's bigger, and it's also on their website um, and things like that. So this one is like a classic infographic. It's that long one and the long ones, like the ones that we saw earlier are really great, but I find them better uh, when they're printed. Although right now on my screen, it's looking pretty good. I hope it's looking good on yours as well. Um, but uh, it's something to consider. What are you doing with it? How are you putting it out into the world? Um, and does this long format work for you or would uh, a different format be better? This one, I won't go follow this link, but I'll, I'll provide all of these links for you for later. Um, but if you follow this link, it takes you to um, an interactive uh, digital infographic. And as it says here, it's 13 reasons why your brain craves infographics. So it has the benefit of also telling you more about infographics, but um, it, it takes you almost through a slideshow, but it's done as a, a rolling um, infographic. So really nicely done. So I encourage you to check it out. Then there's this one that I think we see more often. It's, this is actually um, a PDF that I have put on here. So it doesn't visually look as good, but um, it's uh, synthesized evidence or information 
um, with a particular audience in mind with a, that had a particular need. So this community had a need to kind of know more about um, the, the dosing around uh, the COVID vaccine and asked for, for something. And then they've done it, you can see with visuals and with words to um, meet the needs, uh, the literacy needs of the community that they were working with. This one here is a uh, visual representation of a full research project uh, and using um, like, a, I can't think of the word right now, it'll come to me in a minute, but um, a kind of combination of like the, the graphic note taking kind of design um, and, and whatever brilliant program they use. Uh, and you can see there's certain elements here, um, very little data, this is, this is a qualitative work, but um, you can see this little arrow right here that, that keeps you on track of what the path is. And uh, this is out of um, a project out of SFU. And if you follow the link on this one, when you look at the slides, you'll see that um, each of this full project then is broken into six more uh, infographics that look like a poster that you would see at a conference, but then you drill into them and you can look at each little section of that poster and they each have about six sections. So um, really showing the, the dynamic opportunity as a researcher for using an infographic. And this little picture here is also um, a video uh, on their website. So, you know, you don't, if as a researcher, you spend all sorts of time and thought in, in creating something like this, but there's multiple um, uses for it. Uh, sketch noting that could that's definitely one of the words and there's another term and I'm just you know it's graphic graphic facilitation is what's coming into mind but obviously this uh, anyway I'll come up with it. Um, so we talked a bit about data visualization so I did need to throw it in there and I and I just throwing this in here particularly to talk about the fact that there is ways to do it better than what we're usually most familiar with and this um, is a great to resource here that, that again, you'll see the link um, as Evergreen Data, with Stephanie Evergreen. And um, this is a, an example of a makeover of, of a graph that she's done. So this was the first data visualization. This is the one in pink and black here. And uh, for folks that aren't super into data uh, or really that like graphs very much, which is, I can say me, um, all of these little lines, like I'm not getting anything from it. But when I look at the one on the, the right, the one, that, the redo, um, we see that the message is really clearly pulled out. So that was back to that purpose statement. Make that purpose clear to your audience when they walk away, if they only read this, these two sentences, then they know, um, they know what you're trying to say. And, it's, uh, and it allows for folks that, um, you know, maybe don't want to read graphs to be able to just read the words, but then also this visual representation is showing um, what is happening in this pink and black graph in a more clearly uh, accessible way. And in terms of visibility and visual, the way we look at things, um, these sort of uh, dumbbell plots here or, or a line and a dot is actually a lot easier for us um, to visually understand than just a line. There's a lot of uh, research in this area that you can explore if you're interested in data visualization. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, Kirby mentioned this uh, mo far more in depth than I'm going to, but um, when I'm working with researchers, there's a lot of challenges uh, when they're developing something like an infographic. Um, one of them is balancing the needs of the researcher and the audience, and that is a bit around the language and like wanting to make sure that all the points are there. Um, and sometimes, you know, the full methodology can't actually be in your in your uh, infographic. It sometimes has got to be a little, you know, a footnote to a to a publication or something like that, and that isn't always going to land um, or is a, is a challenge. But then definitely around. Um, jargon, language, even just how one phrases a point um, can be challenging, not trying not to like say too much. Um, and then really, and this is the same as what uh, Kirby mentioned, is that 
having the, the resources as in like the time uh, and the tools. Um, and then of course the skills to put something like this together in a really um, effective and thoughtful way is, is challenging. And um, yeah, so uh, I got through some tips in there and you'll be happy to see that some of these are the same as Kirby's. I just maybe had a few more. Um, and one of the things to emphasize is um, getting feedback from your audience. So uh, Shannon did that, those focus groups that was mentioned earlier with their team, which is great. But if you're say working really closely just with um, one community group, say on one project, uh, really easy to just connect with that, that group and say, what is working for you here? What is not working for you here? Um, do you even want an infographic? And um, would you prefer your information in a different format? So uh, consulting with your audience, I think is, is essential throughout the whole entire process. I had to show an infographic about what makes a good infographic because that makes sense. And it's all things that I've already, we've already talked about, design, having data and the data piece is like having something like if you don't have something really important for that to say, then you know maybe it's not needed. Um, having the story, telling the story through, and being able to share it. Uh, so again, keeping in mind, how is your audience going to read it? Are you going to print it out, or is it going to be on a website, or how are they going to access it? I'm also going to provide you a whole bunch of um, resources so that you can go away and play. Um, and some of those, again, were mentioned uh, by Kirby, but there's some other ones here that I encourage you to check out. And that, I think, is it for me. Sorry, there we go. It's like, Great. why is the screen black? <laughs> Thank you so much, Lupin. I'm really excited to look through that list that you uh, included at the end of your slides there. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to our final speaker of the day, Valerie Hushka. Valerie has a PhD in human health and nutritional sciences from the University of Guelph, where her research examined chronic stress and metabolism. She's always been passionate about science communication, and she currently works in the Research Innovation Office as a Knowledge Mobilization and Communications Coordinator. So over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much for having me today. Let me just get my PowerPoint going here. Awesome. So like I, uh, like I was introduced, my name is Valerie Hrushka. I use she, her pronouns primarily, but perfectly happy with they, them as well. I join you today from the University of Guelph, which occupies land encompassed by the Between the Lakes Treaty, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit Anishinaabek Nation in what is known today as Ontario. At the University of Guelph, our mission is to improve life. So specifically in my department, the Research Innovation Office, we act like a concierge service. Uh, where we facilitate research exchange in and out of the university, including with partners in industry and the protection and commercialization of intellectual property created at U of G. I myself fulfill a knowledge mobilization and communications role, uh, and I bring with me a background in human health sciences. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, but I will be spotlighting some work that um, I did as part of my lab that I did my grad studies with. And I put a copy of these slides in the chat so you can zoom in on anything of interest and there are links to everything that I've referenced throughout the document. Uh, if you just hover over the images themselves, uh, you should be able to uh, check them out. So today I'm going to focus my attention on infographics in the academic research enterprise from three perspectives, all of which center around the philosophy that research is fundamentally meant to be shared. Uh, an important note that I'll make at the beginning is that we need to think of infographics as a multifunctional tool. And depending on how we use them, we can have excellent research infographics for research audiences and excellent infographics for the general public, but likely not both at the same time. And that's perfectly okay. We need to think of our audience as specifically as we can to meet their needs first, rather than compromising to please everyone all at once, which we all know will never really work. So the academic research enterprise can be considered like a factory of sorts where researchers produce knowledge as a product that can be applied in the real world. When we don't make sure that that knowledge gets into the right hands, we may as well lock it up in a vault for all the good it's doing. So in my opinion, at its simplest, we would not be doing our jobs as researchers if we kept this knowledge to ourselves. I view it as a disservice to the taxpayers that fund our labs, the organizations that support us, and the lives that our research could improve. The absence of any research sharing activities isn't the only way to keep knowledge locked up. We also have to make sure that we do those activities well. 
And infographics are one of many tools that we can use to share that knowledge strategically and with a diverse set of stakeholders. As researchers, we must always be cognizant of any mandates that our funders pose to us. And we know that robust KMB plans are an increasingly important component of funding applications. We should also be mindful of any other dissemination policies that we have to abide by. If the goal is to have our research used, then we know that multifaceted or layered KMB strategic plans yield better uptake of that research. So including infographics as a layer of that plan is a wise move. Infographics can help us to establish a professional research reputation by spreading awareness of our research programs, the results of our projects, and our skills as science communicators. And all of these factors fit within the personal knowledge exchange philosophies that inform what priorities we have personally when thinking about infographics as research tools. One of the most common ways we engage in knowledge exchange with our peers in academia is through events like conferences where we can use posters as a medium to present our research processes and its implications. Conference posters have a long history of being both chock full of important data and not terribly engaging, but this is slowly changing. Increasingly, we're seeing a shift to more high, uh, high level light text, streamlined and visually descriptive posters that serve as great examples of academic level infographics without sacrificing the quality of the data that we present or the degree of professionalism that we embody. We're seeing a similar culture shift beginning in the academic publishing industry with the growing popularity of graphical or visual abstracts that accompany published articles. These visual abstracts are a single graphic summary of the main takeaways of the paper meant to draw readers into the article, essentially an infographic about your paper. More journals are offering this as an option now, and I've linked to a few publishers' guidelines on preparing these visual abstracts. Visual abstracts are not intended to be replacements for actually reading the paper, and even though there are publishing guidelines uh, like the suggested format here in the bottom left from Elsevier, we can see that there isn't an, an exact formula or template that absolutely must be followed for every visual abstract published by a specific journal, and there's no uniform regulation across the publishing industry. That has its pros and cons. Pros, you can be as creative as you'd like, and there's flexibility to present the information in the way that works best for your project and your anticipated audience. Cons, there aren't any well-established best practices for ensuring that these visual abstracts are optimized across the industry. So we can't assume that every visual abstract is de facto appropriate for the general public because of the context needed to interpret the results, the complexity of the language used, access to the article without paid subscriptions, or even knowing how to search for it in the first place, among other considerations. But if done strategically, what we know from the few studies that have investigated the impact of visual abstracts points towards them being beneficial for research engagement. Visual abstracts can add interest to your paper and help make it more likely to draw readers in and prioritize reading your paper, maybe even cite your paper. They can also make your key findings more salient, so there's less misunderstanding about your study's results and implications. And we can use visual abstracts as tools to generate discourse on your research, and this format lends itself very well to social media. And even if you personally don't want to get involved in social media, the journal you publish with can, or interested readers can help spread the word now that you've teed up that shot. So that covers researchers, and we won't stop there. Uh, let's think about stakeholders. So research stakeholders can be defined as anyone outside of the immediate research team that stands to benefit or lose uh, from the research activity. More internal to the research enterprise, we have stakeholders like funding agencies, project partners, and even our participants. We can use infographics to communicate the status of our project, summaries of data, plans for next steps, and more. The infographic uh, here in particular was developed by my former lab, the Guelph Family Health Study, to communicate the results of a survey we did so that we could relay back to our participants what we learned, how they helped to contribute, and what our lab was going to do next to help meet the needs that they identified. External to the research enterprise, we can think about stakeholders like clinicians uh, or practitioners that work in this field. For us, our research is most relevant for groups like dietitians, physicians, family program directors, and similar professional groups. We developed a series of research summary articles for them uh, in partnership with a nutrition focused NGO, which included infographics like the one seen here. There may also be partners in industry that could benefit from understanding your research as well as policymakers who could have an impact on your sector if they're more 
uh, informed about the state of the science. So everyone directly involved in the research enterprise from the researchers themselves to internal and external stakeholders stands to benefit from increased use of infographics. But what about those more distant to the research, like the broad general public, who may or may not have a direct stake in our research project's implications? It's my personal opinion that any research that receives public funding should be reported back to the public for full transparency and accountability. We hope that by publishing journal articles, we get close enough to that goal. But the sad reality is that not all projects get published, and even the ones that do aren't always read. Um, the general public, by and large, does not read research papers. Even us researchers don't always love reading them. Uh, but they still stand to be impacted by our research programs, so we need another option than conventional publishing. So if we think about infographics for the general public as clear and engaging research summaries, we unlock a really powerful tool. Infographics can help fill a gap in research communication for many people who lack the extensive research training and scientific literacy to understand research papers, their quality, the implications of the results, or again, how to access them in the first place. That's why it's important for us to use clear and plain language when communicating with the general public. And a concise summary of the, re, uh, the results and their implications can remove these barriers to understanding while capitalizing on humans' preferences uh, for visual learning. We can also present this summary with our lab information so that the reader knows that they can trust us as an authority on this issue and know who to follow up with if they want to know more. And whether it be in digital or printed media, it is possible for infographics to have a wide reaching and powerful impact that helps close a substantial gap in the research to public knowledge pathway. And as we know from the past two years, this gap can be devastating, even deadly. Some examples of plain language infographics, again, from my previous lab, which we published in popular press on the left and in products developed for the general public on the right, uh, plus social media distribution as well. So my hope is that we can all see the potential for infographics to be used as agents of change and powerful enough to impact a diverse range of audiences. So where do we go from here? Academia is a slow to change industry and it can be difficult to advocate for new formats or break the mold of what's been done before. You may find yourself limited by your field's practices or your research team's willingness to experiment with these ideas. It's tough and I wish there was a guarantee I could give you, but the best we can do is to keep challenging the norm and questioning how we can best serve those who can benefit from our research. We can form communities of practice that can serve us and support this system uh, in our work or build one ourselves if we can't find one. Everyone joining us today is proof that there are others interested in these ideas. So using this community to share tips, bounce ideas off of and collect research and resources to support us as we advocate for research communication can be a huge benefit. In a medium as artistic and subjective as infographics, there's very few rules about right and wrong ways to design infographics. So have fun, experiment, make mistakes, and try again. And with that, I will close by thanking you all for your time and attention and thanking the organizers for having me here today. Great. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, and thanks again to all of our speakers and all of the attendees for um, working or sticking with us while we worked through those technical difficulties. Um, very happy that all of the presentations went smoothly. We didn't drop the call again. Uh, but now we have a little bit of time for a short Q&A period. Uh, so like I said before, if you have any questions you'd like to ask our panelists, please do send them through the chat um, and we can hopefully get to them. Uh, but maybe the first thing I wanted to bring up just to get us started while people are thinking of some questions they'd like to ask, uh, it just kind of came up during your talk, Valerie, um, about the researcher's obligation uh, to share information and their research. So I was curious if, do you see, or to everyone in the panel, have you seen a shift in this? Uh, do you think researchers and those in academia are kind of responsive and open to this kind of move towards uh, accessible research derivatives? Or do you think there is still some hesitancy in kind of exploring these different paths? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I, I don't wanna overstep by saying that I speak for, for more than I actually do, but in, in my experience, we are seeing things change slowly. And it, it's almost like baby steps of letting other people kind of test the water first. And uh, once we see that that goes well, we're a little bit more uh, able to jump in. But uh, I think we see it more with things like the growing popularity of lab focused social media and, and advocating for yourself and your research outside of just journal spaces. So whether that's 
um, publishing in the popular press or through mediums like the conversation that help to bridge the gap a little bit more. I do think that we're moving that way. And I think infographics are a really compelling tool to do that. I think we're a couple steps behind where uh, non-academics might be just because kind of the institution is kind of time tested and a little bit rigid uh, in that respect as well. But I'd be curious to know other people's thoughts as well. Go ahead, Evan. Sure, thanks. Uh, and thanks, uh, Valerie and Lupin. Lupin, I'm going to steal some ideas right back, so all's well. Uh, those were great presentations and fantastic to learn from. Um, just about um, <clears throat> about the, the question you've asked, Shannon, uh, I'm like, we don't get turned down very often, I guess is the way that I would put it, in the sense that when we approach a researcher and we say, we'd like to do this project with your articles uh, or your article, the approach, or sorry, the, the response is generally positive. Uh, I think that what I'm seeing is that researchers are interested in knowledge mobilization, uh, knowledge exchange. They do want to engage in these types of projects. Uh, they may, uh, for uh, you know, <laughs> workload-related reasons, not have the time to devise them themselves. And that's why we're pretty enthusiastic about sort of steering student work towards it and being able to mobilize that. In support of uh, in support of researchers needs to get their research out there. They're generally like they're like you want to read our article, <laughs> fantastic, um, and then they're like oh and you're actually going to get more readers for us. That's even better. So um, broadly, my answer I think is yes. There's interest. There's just sort of a bit of a gap in terms of being able to um, find the time in the average scholar's uh, workday to devote to it. Kirby or Lupin, did you have anything to add, or we can? Hop over to the next question. I see um, there's some something very here. sorry, Shannon. Just something very brief to add um, that I think it's also there's significant disciplinary differences. So most of my research is in literary studies, and when I have recently published, I've been asked would I like to record a podcast on my um, on my article, and I see that that's becoming a lot more uh, prevalent. Um, and I mean, that's a way in which to do knowledge mobilize and knowledge translate to a wider audience. And I think that's great, but it would be really interesting to think about uh, infographics for literary based uh, scholarship. Um, and, and that may reach a, a wider audience. Really simply, Shannon, I'd say, because I have been working in this space for a really long time. <laughs> yes, it's changed a lot. But yes, it's different depending on the discipline. And yes, it, um, there's some folks that are, are not interested. And, um, you know, but uh, I'd say leaps and bounds over for the, from 20 years ago. Great, thank you so much. And it's so great to hear, um, like you said, Lupin, you've been doing this work for a long time. So just hear these different perspectives and also from these different um, fields of study has been so great. Um, but we did get a question in the chat, and I think this would be a really interesting one to touch on before we wrap up for the day. Uh, so the question asks or states, I've noticed an increase in social media, particularly Instagram infographics, and they tend to vary in form from traditional research uh, infographics to posters. However, I think many people agree platforms like Instagram were not created to facilitate education necessarily. Uh, do any of the presenters have thoughts on how to find a balance between matching this new style of infographics while also presenting research in a manner that is responsible, despite the limitations of these social media platforms? It's kind of a long one with some bits, but if anyone wants to jump on any of that, feel free. I will just start us off with saying that it, like I said in, in my presentation, is that the, um, the, the channel that you use is going to depend on your audience and your message. And so if your audience isn't on Instagram or your message can't be appropriately um, shared in that manner, then yeah, you probably, that's probably not the best approach. Um, but uh, if it does make sense, if that is where your audience is and um, you can share what you need on there, uh, then, that, then, it, then great, go for it. I don't think we need to police ourselves on that, but, um, but I don't think, I don't think everybody should be using Instagram. I don't think everybody should use, be using infographics either. I think it depends on, again, I'm gonna yeah, repeat myself, but on the purpose and the audience and the information that you're sharing. That, that sounds right to me. 
uh, too, Lupin. Um, I think like we've we've talked a little bit about this in our team as well. Uh, whether we want to have a social media strategy, whether we want to think about in, uh, Instagram slideshows uh, as a another form, and uh, like I think my my approach to it is the way it is to a lot of different technologies or cultural forums, right? They're not inherently regressive or inherently progressive in and of themselves. It's sort of what you do with them. And if you can figure out a way to make a good, uh, you know, research slideshow for Instagram that has integrity and sort of uh, is, isn't sort of knocking off all of the important edges of a research piece, then go for it. Um, you know, I liked, Lupin, when you were talking about those graphic facilitations, right? <laughs> the sketch noting idea, the idea of sort of being able to focus on different parts of it, maybe that lends itself. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think that the, the sort of intention of the platform like Instagram needs to equal its use. We can definitely uh, hijack it and do different things on it. That's my approach anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. So if that was um, everything our panelists had to say about that particular question, we are reaching the end of our time. So I'm going to pass it over to Nick again, just to wrap up the panel and um, leave us with some closing remarks. Thanks so much, Shannon. And again, huge thank you to all of our amazing panelists today, Evan Kirby, Lupin and Valerie. Um, I, I was, you know, fur furiously taking notes myself and uh, really learned a lot from this session and I expect everyone else did as well. Uh, I have some more thank yous, but before I get to those, I just wanted to put in a brief plug for uh, an event uh, we have coming up on April 8th called the Downtown Eastside Research Describeathon. Uh, and this is going to be a two hour uh, workshop where we're going to be learning about best practices for writing clear language descriptions based on some of the research in the research access portal and collaborating together to write some new descriptions that will go into the portal. Uh, so if you have an interest in this other sort of way of making research a little bit more accessible to the general public, uh, and particularly our audiences here for the research access portal, I'd highly encourage you to sign up. Um, without further ado, I'd like to jump into our thank yous. So from the Public Humanities Hub, Mary Chapman, uh, Sydney Lines, and Heidi Rennert, uh, thank you so much for all of your support and uh, getting us kicked off here today. Um, Heather O'Brien from the Story Project for her contributions to the toolkit that we're putting together, uh, as well as Elizabeth Johnston, who is another student librarian at the MRAI and helped us uh, with some of our preparations for the panel today. today. Uh, as Evan and Kirby already mentioned, Heather Holroyd and Angela Towell at the UBC Learning Exchange, as well as Desiree Barron at the Vancouver Public Library for their work in getting us kicked off uh, with the AST100 MRAI collaboration. Uh, and then last but not least, all of the amazing participants who joined us today, um, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, and I also wanted to put in a thank you as well to Shannon for uh, your amazing work moderating today's panel. Um, so that's all I've got to say. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing a recording of this talk, uh, as well as the completed toolkit uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>